So uh, just introduce yourself and talk about where you're from and how long you've been doing photography. Mm, okay, that's kind of that's kind of vague. Uh, let me think for a second. Um, Hi, I'm Steve Dietgetty. I'm a fine art erotic slash fetish photographer. I currently live in Los Angeles and I've been living here for a little over 20 years. Uh, before that, I lived in Chicago for most of the 1990s and that's where I first developed my style of photography and I eventually found my way out here in LA. And how is LA? Talk about, talk about LA and your experience here. <laughs> In 1998, I moved to Los Angeles from Chicago, and it was kind of a, a, a cultural shift for me. Being a mostly a natural light photographer, it was kind of difficult getting used to the constant sunshine and the oversaturation of color in, in LA, in Southern California in general. In Chicago, it was overcast a lot of times, and everything had a very nice, muted, soft tone to it so i didn't know how to really deal with harsh sunlight so it was a whole different shooting environment for me so it took me a while maybe like a year or so to finally reinvent my my attitude toward natural light and um, i'm glad i did because I, as a photographer i always want to evolve and change so i was very happy to get out of my comfort zone and work with a, a brand new palette of colors and light what got you into erotic photography? What got me into erotic photography? Um, I mean, I've always had an interest in fetishism, eroticism, even when I was a small kid and I didn't even know what that stuff was. I knew I was interested in women's shoes and women's boots for some reason. I, I had no idea when I was, you know, eight years old. It, they just, something about the shape of the the female foot when they're put in that position just really intrigued me. So once I became of age and I understood what sexuality was, then it all started kind of coming together. Uh, parallel to that, I also had an interest in photography because my dad was a very serious amateur photographer. So he taught me how to use the dark room and just how to use cameras. And so eventually the two interests collided and that was around 1990 or so. My then girlfriend and I went out on my back porch. I had a brand new medium format camera and we had just been to London and we just bought some latex clothing. So she put it on, we went in the backyard and took some pictures and those pictures ended up getting a lot of attention back then. They got published in international magazines. Keep in mind, this was before the internet as we know it today. So everything was done through magazines and books. So I had to you know, physically send prints that I printed myself in the darkroom to all these publications and just hoping that someone would, would take them. And the, the interest was wonderful. People just really responded to it because fetish photography just had not been shown in that kind of light before. So I just so I kind of put a new new take on the genre, which at the time was kind of void of aesthetic quality. So in the early '90s, myself, uh, people like Eric Kroll, and some other photographers in in England helped put uh, fetish photography on the map and had it uh, respected in a different light. In terms of mentors. I was always influenced more by portrait photography, uh, especially older portrait photography, like turn of the century, like Baron Adolf de Meyer and up through the 1940s, uh, uh, Richard Avedon's fashion photography. I just really liked that vibe. I liked the, the natural light he was using at the time. And I kind of drew my inspiration from just loving that type of light and their compositions. and. But one of my, the biggest influence, I think when I was a teenager, when I first started seriously getting into photography was uh, Annie Leibovitz. Because this was in the early, late 70s, early 80s when she was doing all the Rolling Stone magazine covers. And she was one of the first photography, photographers that showed me that, wow, you can be a photographer and have an individual style. Like when you saw one of her photographs, you knew it was her. Her name didn't even have to be on the thing. And that really intrigued me that someone could speak through their photography and 
put out a cohesive volume of work and you would know who it was. So that really intrigued me. And at the time I didn't really quite have my my style yet. So like a lot of young artists do, they, they tend to mimic their their the people that they're influenced by. And you can do that for a while and then hopefully you you start finding your own sense of purpose and your own eye, which is what happened to me. I mean I was always bad at trying to copy Annie Leibowitz or Richard Avedon. I mean some of those attempts were pretty pretty disastrous. But in the meantime it it taught me how to see how I see and then trend translate that to film. So that was a, a very, very valuable experience as a young photographer. What defines my style is more of a sense of realism. I like my photograph to appear natural as if they were scenes that could happen in anyone's living room. I've never really been into the full studio photography and fancy lighting. I like creating a sense of familiarity with the viewer. So that's why I, I love natural light. I don't create my own light. Uh, it just has to seem real. So I like capturing my models in moments of seemingly when they're kind of caught off guard and where they're just you know getting ready for, for a photo shoot. But I've just never been into that whole strike a pose, be sexy, glamor, fake sexiness. I just never appealed to me. And I think that's because of my love of other photography when I was a kid too. I just wanted to have that look of, of realness basically. So um, that's pretty much defines my style for me when I shoot. You know, does, does this look real? Does, does it look contrived? And uh, if it doesn't look right, then I just do not take the picture. Throughout your career, describe the, the type of the evolution of cameras that you've used since the beginning till now. Mm, good question. Okay. The kind of cameras I've used has varied throughout the years. In fact, when I was really young and into photography, when I was first starting to appreciate it, I was really into crystal clear photography. That, that's what I wanted to do. So my very first camera that my parents bought for me, which I wanted so badly, was a 4x5 view camera, which was kind of fun, but it was very cumbersome. And I, I realized with my style, I needed to be a little bit more mobile. And so I thought, I, I just can't do this. It was, it was just too formal. And 35 millimeter at the time, to me, just looked a little too grainy. And so medium format was the, the perfect uh, format for me. So I got a Mamiya 645 when I was I don't know, like 15 or 16. And that created the sharp images that I wanted and also allowed me to move around as if I was holding a 35 millimeter camera. So that's the camera I've been using ever since. I shoot with other cameras too, but my medium format black and white photography is the, the one consistent style that I, that I continue to do through this day. But besides that, I like experimenting too. I like Polaroids, I like Holgas. Digital, I do digital photography, but I prefer film because I like the discipline of film where I know I only have a very finite amount of exposures. So I, I'm very careful about what I take a picture of. So I just don't shoot and shoot and shoot and just waste and waste and waste. I'm very thrifty because it costs money for each medium format roll, you know. So um, I, I don't, click that shutter unless I'm pretty darn sure that shot's going to work. Give us a sense of, uh, you shot a lot of celebrities and famous models. Tell us, some, uh, tell us a few. Okay. I've had some occasions to shoot celebrities and other famous people. It was mainly in the early, or, uh, yeah, early 90s. My high school, actually grade school friend was filmmaker George Hickenlooper. And he directed uh, the movie The Mayor of the Sunset Strip, which was about Rodney Bingenheimer. So George had already moved out here to L.A. working on his film career. And then I moved out here in 98. So in 98 is when he was working on this Rodney Bingenheimer documentary. So being his friend, he asked me to come along to all his shoots. So it was in this little period over a year where I got to shoot some like 
pretty pretty cool people. I got uh, nice portraits of Brian Wilson in his living room. I got Rodney Bingenheimer, Cher, Billy Bob Thornton, uh, Ray Manzarek of The Doors, and you know quite a few more. But uh, it was a, a it was a unique experience. Personally, don't like shooting famous people, especially ones I just don't know personally because there's just no connection between me and them. And when I shoot with a model, I mean, there's definitely a, a connection. And usually when with a celebrity, you only have this amount of time to shoot them. And it's just, and there's just absolutely, there's like a wall between me and the, and the subject. And it's, it's kind of unnerving. I just don't like that process. I mean, having a, a shot of a cool, famous person is cool, but to me, it's not what my photography is about. What about the famous models and the fetish models? I have shot famous fetish models mainly because I was growing up with them at the time. So I guess the most famous right now would be Dita Von Teis. So when I first started sh doing my photography, she was first starting doing her modeling. So when I first did a photo shoot with her in 1999, you know, she was well known and I was kind of well known too, so, but you know, she was one of my models and you know, I got to know her. And so when we did a photo shoot, it was always like just two friends doing a photo shoot together. So it wasn't like, ooh, I'm shooting Dita Von Teese and um, I'm shooting a celebrity. Back then it was just, you know, I was just another fetish photographer. She was just another fetish model. And we were just both doing what we enjoyed doing at the time. Besides photography, I, I mean, I do have a lot of interests. Like right now, my girlfriend and I are, are really into Disneyland. We go all over the world going to the different parks. Something I wasn't quite sure that I had an interest in many years ago, but um, there's just a, a sense of nostalgia that you're just engulfed with when you go to, especially the original Disneyland. That, uh, I mean, we go at least once a month. It's we just find it a very fun, comforting place to go to. Even, if, even though if we don't do any rides, it's just fun hanging out there. Everyone seems to be having a really good time and it's just a very positive place to hang out. <laughs> do you take pictures there? Uh, do I take pictures at Disneyland? Not, I mean, other than snapshot type pictures and pictures of my girlfriend posing with Minnie Mouse, but I, I've never done like a, like a actual gorilla style photo shoot. But I have, I have thought of it though. You know, so it, it may be something that you might see it one of these days. Action. Yeah, I've had uh, quite a few books published. Uh, my first one came out in 1998, which was all the work that I had done in the early 90s when I lived in Chicago. So it was from 1990 to 1998 or so. And that was the, those were the years of, of my, my formative years when I developed my style and when I was just shooting a, just a ton of new innovative type stuff. Um, my favorite photography publisher at the time was Edition Stemley out of Zurich. And all their books were just gorgeous. They're all my favorite photographers. So after a while, I realized that I had a, enough work that would probably make a really good book. So I thought, okay, I'm going to spend a year or so and invest some money and print all these photographs and just send to all my favorite publishers and just try to try to get a publishing deal. So with Edition Stemley being my favorite publisher, I decided to contact them first. So I sent them, I don't know, probably like 10, 10 8 by 10 prints that I made in my dark room and some postcards I had made up and, and, and I sent it to them. And then a couple weeks later, I got a letter from them saying that they really liked what they saw and they wanted to see more. So I packed up a giant box stacked with prints about that high and sent them to them. And then a couple weeks later, they said, yeah, we would love to, we'd love to do your first book. So that was, that was just thrilling that not only was I going to get published, but it was by my favorite publisher. So that book, The Beauty of Fetish, uh, did really well and is today considered a, a classic in that genre. And then after I moved to LA, I had accumulated a new body of work three years later. And that's when they decided they wanted to publish The Beauty of Fetish Volume 2. So that came out around 2001. And, uh, and that also did very well. And then I 
then I just kept shooting and shooting and just doing more work. And it wasn't until 2014 or so that I thought, you know, I should do a new book. And I was contacted by uh, this great fine art publisher, Century Guild, and they wanted to do a, a series of books. And so I thought, okay, yeah. I mean, enough time has passed where I could do a multi-volume collection of work. So we decided to do the Arrangement series, which would encompass my whole career from 1990 to, at that time, 2015. And we would do it in a reverse chrono chronological order because all my very first pictures were, had already been published in my first two books. So we thought, okay, we'll start with all the new stuff first. So we released volume three first, which was from the years 2008 to 2015. So that, that came out in 2016 and did really well. And now I'm supposed to be working on volume two, which would be the years 2000 to 2007. And then volume one will be 1990 to 1998. So those are still in the works. I'm still working on those. In the meantime, uh, a British publisher by the name of Circa Press contacted me and they wanted to do a, a, a book and they want to do like a little side project. So this new book that's come out is called Extempore, which is basically a book compiling little in-between moments in my photo shoots. Shots where the model was kind of off guard, whether they're fixing their clothes or in very candid situations and some outtakes. So it's a very beautiful volume of work and it's coming out next month, which would be July of 2019. So once that's done and I'm done promoting it, then I'll continue working on the arrangement series, which hopefully will come out within the next couple of years. Action. Okay. One of the things as a photographer, I've, as a challenge that's always worked out for me is using limitations to my advantage. Uh, I've never been a, a tech guy, so I've never really been into having the the greatest, newest cameras at all. I mean, I've been using my Mamiya 645 since 1990. I've had the same Canon A1, which I've had since I was a teenager. I bought that thing when I was 15 years old. Uh, to me, it's, it's the photographer who takes good pictures, not, not the camera. So I've always just been a fan of using what I have and making the best of it. That has to do with cameras. It has to do with lighting locations, the model, um, throw me in a situation, no matter what room, like if, uh, if I was gonna take pictures of a model right here in this space, you know, I would scope out the area, I'd go like, okay, the light's pretty good over there. Oh, it's pretty good there too, and there's some interesting lines and uh, things like that. And I can put the model up against that because the light's good. And I just, I just like finding good places to shoot rather than creating my own light, which to me is, is like the most foreign thing I can imagine. I just do not want to create my own light. I like seeking it out and making it work. And then that, that goes along with my wanting to make my photos look as familiar as possible because it's all natural light. It's not all souped up and, and unrealistic. So with my cameras, I mean, I just, I, I have what I have to get by with and I'm, I'm thrilled for that.